everybody, it's Tyler here at Fit Waco, checking team number 624, Kryptonite, uh, coming off a fantastic last year, looking really good uh, this year as well, too, as we're recording this, one of the top seeds at the event, so they're looking for big things here at Waco, and I know the as well, too. Take a look at 624's robot this year. Uh, they have a great arm intake that they're going with. Uh, watching it on the field, they're getting better and better with it, so it's really cool to see that improvement happen with them. Of course, we'll be talking about uh, that intake, the arm, some of the programming that's gone into it, a little bit of feedback and some pathing coming up here on Behind the Bumpers. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. Kettering University is looking for talented robotics students who want to continue learning and innovating in a hands-on real-world experience format. Kettering University representatives will be at dozens of FIRST events this season, including the championship. Go to kettering.edu slash FIRST to see which events you can meet a Kettering University representative. FRC competition season is here. Submit your favorite moments to FRC Clips of the Week by each Sunday at discord.gg slash first updates now. Also, the FRC Top 25 poll is open Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern to Monday, 5 p.m. Eastern, where you can vote for your top 25 teams of the week at firstupdatesnow.com slash FRC Top 25. Sorry down this robot pan. Talk to me about the uh, intake here. Um, one thing I love to hear about with teams who are going with this style of uh, arm and intake is how did you kind of figure out like this intake was going to work out well for your team. And I'd always love to hear, especially like the width of the intake, how did you figure out that worked out? Yeah, so originally we started with a floor intake and so it, it popped down just like um, last year's where it was um, a retractable. Um, but we found that that didn't really integrate well with the arm that we had here, the telescoping arm. So instead of doing that, we switched to purely a grabber, which at first we had two, um, at first, we had two arms that uh, squeezed. At first, we had. At first, we had two arms that pinched together. But then we found out that the rollers uh, worked better than the the, new, the pneumatic uh, system. So um, here we have four rollers that are connected using the poly band, and we figured out the dimensions from just testing. It was a lot of testing. It was a lot of um, trial and error, using CAD to figure out the geometry, all of the above. Um, and then on, on top of the um, on top of the intake, we did have issues with the two arms torquing in opposite directions. Sure. So we have these stabilizers here, and there's another one on the bottom, as well as uh, the wrist gear. So the the gear has limits, of course, but it's Pretty, pretty consistent, and then we're able to flip this intake. The intake goes all the way over, it flips in on itself so that we can get uh, game pieces out of this funnel. So this lines up straight to the human player substation, and the human player drops either the cones or the cubes in, and the intake can pick it up from the inside of the bot. And so that, are, you, are you picking up from the ground as well too, yes, or are you just mostly from getting the from, both, from the uh, station? Um, we mostly, honestly right now, it's mostly ground intake, which okay. is uh, interesting, but we do utilize the funnel system for cubes. We want to improve upon this and really make it so cones are consistent as well. Um, the cones can be a little, a little difficult because we have to put them in the tip first. Number nine needs to go to cube. Yeah. So that's um, it, and taking a cube from what would be the ground, yeah. the, the intake goes kind of down here. I'm sorry about my <laughs> Oh no. Um, it goes down, angled to the ground so that we can successfully pick that up. And then, of course, could we flip it on the inside? Like, in on itself. That yeah. was automated. So that whole entire sequence was automated sure. so that we can successfully get it in. It's not manual. Um, so during a, what you're saying is during a match, that will be an automated process yes, that you go exactly. through. For, and then uh, you were talking about as uh, the cubes come in as well, too. How does that process work for you from the uh, station area? So first the robot lines up, and then we'll have the human player just drop it in. And that entire process, the spinning is not automated. So that is. Uh, human input, but the the process of getting there was automated, sure. so that can stay consistent throughout. 
Uh, Brody, let's talk to about the arm a little bit more and what's gone into the telescoping arm for it. Uh, I'd love to hear, you know, this design that you have is, is a very unique design that I've seen amongst robots this year. So uh, what went into creating something like this? And uh, I'd love to hear about any maybe any other uh, iterations or thought processes that you had before you came up with this product as well. Okay, so initially we wanted to uh, we wanted to look at some sort of pink arm inspired device. That way we could reach on both sides sure. and and, uh, and funnel uh, cones and cubes that way. And so we really wanted to do a center pivot with a telescoping arm. And one thing we really wanted to look at was how light can we make the arm to avoid any sort of uh, potential problems with a heavy arm. So we thought, well, what's really light? We thought carbon fiber. So what we did is we did a. Uh, a series of trusses, three trusses of carbon fiber tubes that uh, slide on linear bearings. Or, uh, in the pit. Sorry, bushings. And they uh, qualification match 48. And they extend uh, one motor power. Be yeah, so if you so can bring it out, you can see it collapses, fits inside the bot, and now it extends past. And it's a three stage system. We got this 14 millimeter carbon fiber out here on the end. Yeah. Super light, super thin. And we've got these beefier 20 millimeter carbon fiber tubes holding it out. And um, some of the challenges we had with this was actuating this final stage. We initially tried using chain, but that caused several problems because you'd have to get the chain through this. Yeah. Okay. And so we had the idea: well, if we ran a carbon or if we ran a Kevlar rope all the way through, it wouldn't get in the way of anything. That's what I was going to ask you. It's like this doesn't look like a typical rope on there. So I'm going to say, how did you come up with this heavy enough tensile strength for what you needed then? Uh, so, so that's really cool that, that, that you had that thought process to go through for that. Uh, on your arm, from, a, from the packaging standpoint of the telescope itself, uh, how did you determine that you had to go with that many stages uh, versus going maybe like only two stages or something? Well, I, I spent a lot of late nights playing with different numbers of stages and seeing how they would fit with sure. different pivot heights. And it was really just a bunch of tinkering that took me to find out what lengths would work here. Uh, Kartik, as we talk about uh, the arm and the programming side of the arm, obviously a lot that goes into this to make sure it's working right. out on the field for that. So talk to me a little bit more about that and uh, a couple other right. things that are cool on the robot from programming. All right, got it. So first, we can start off with the arm. So as you can see now, it's drooping down. Um, so how we uh, do our arm set points is that due to the deflection of the pivot at times at going at fast speeds, We've, we've used trapezoidal motion profiling, which essentially ramps up the speed at the beginning and maintains a constant velocity. And then near the set point, it slows down so that we don't have a bunch of deflection on our pivot like sure. this. Yeah. And then that helps us stabilize our set points in Auton and in Telia both and helps us score efficiently rather than just swinging on the set point there. And then we have a feed forward that accounts for the gravity um, that's acting on the arm because the intake is pretty heavy and it uh, makes the arm droop down and the brake mode can't just handle that. Um, next is. For the telescope extending, we uh, just use a normal PID, which extends out to the set point uh, and gets there efficiently and really quickly. Um, and then with the wrist, we've also implemented trapezoidal profiling, uh, where we wanted to get to the set point slowly so that it's not uh, quickly moving the arm up and down, which would cause more deflection towards sure. the set point. Um, something else we've also implemented, um, as we talked about the funnel before, we want to have efficient funnel cycling, which is really integral to our uh, cy uh, cycle times. So we've automated the process of lining up with the single substation on the field, which is done by uh, the odometry of the robot uh, on the field, which is like an XY plane. And we just set the odometry to, because it's at a um, constant place. And we press a button which aligns with that uh, rotationally and uh, in the X axis. So which um, allows us to just back up and then the human player quickly drops the ball. So you're uh, only doing that odometry point when you're lining up or you have that running the entire match? So odometry is running the entire match, okay. which is resetting with our uh, April tags that we That's see That's what I was going to ask. How are you compensating for that yeah. drift when you have yeah, that? So sure. we, we see that April tag and if we're confident enough that that's the right April tag that we want to see, we update our odometry. Um, and then when we get when once we cycle back, we see the April tag before we go back. So it resets our odometry, and then we have a more accurate um, su uh, single substation lineup for that. Let's start to wrap up on this robot. Uh, Eli, talk to me about uh, some of your autonomous modes, what you're doing now, what you're looking at the future, and anything else to wrap up your program and your bot. All right, so we actually have a pretty custom autonomous uh, creator here. So th uh, this is it. We actually are running this on the robot right now. So that's running on this coprocessor over here. Um, and that helps with fast uh, debugging and optimizing of the paths. We don't have to worry about deploying anything. And the reason why we have a custom one is just to have more control over the paths uh, that we are creating. 
So I'm going to go in and show uh, creating an auton. So I'm just give it a random title. So I'm going to select a starting position. And then, uh, yeah, we're able to control where the robot is going on curves here. And this is all being sent live to the um, coprocessor, and we can run this and uh, using scripts that are also on the coprocessor. So we have the Auton running pretty much entirely off of it. Um, and then the Java side, all it does is just follow the coprocessor's instructions. So you can pretty much just make code on the fly. Like if you come to a match, you're like, oh my goodness, we don't have this sort of autonomous. Like you can pretty much just load that and kick it in. Yeah, right? we, we do usually like to test them at least well, a few I mean, times. Well, I mean, sometimes, you know. <laughs> yeah, we could. <laughs> that, that's really cool. I love seeing the, the customness to this as well. You know, a lot of teams we've seen using like, you know, Path Planner and that right. sort of thing like that. But this is a great take, I think, that Kryptonite brings with a little bit extra flair as well. So, Kryptonite, thank you so much for talking to us more about your bot. Uh, of course, wish you best of luck here. You're doing great as a recording. So, of course, looking forward to big things here. And, of course, show up the rest of your competition soon. Thanks a lot. All right. This video on First Updates Now is made possible by viewers like you and also the following sponsors. Kettering University is looking for talented robotic students who want to continue learning and innovating in a hands-on, real-world experience format. Kettering University representatives will be at dozens of FIRST events this season, including the championship. Go to kettering.edu slash FIRST to see which events you can meet a Kettering University representative. FRC competition season is here. Submit your favorite moments to FRC Clips of the Week by each Sunday at discord.gg slash FIRST updates now. Also, the FRC Top 25 poll is open Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern to Monday, 5 p.m. Eastern, where you can vote for your top 25 teams of the week at firstupdatesnow.com slash FRC Top 25. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash firstupdatesnow, join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash firstupdatesnow, and check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.